with, without uh, getting bogged down in it, I disagree with you about uh, rates of recidivism, but th that's, let's put that to the side because it's a little bit uh, uh, different than the discussion about what kind of process should be due. Um, I fall somewhere between Raha and Ben on this question, probably a little bit more actually towards Raha's uh, side. Uh, I think there, there's two issues um, that are here. Uh, one, as Raha mentioned, um, people who are picked up in Mali or in Afghanistan or elsewhere uh, are not going to be wearing uniforms. Um, you know, it's it's much easier to tell, you know, who is an enemy combatant in the case of World War II, where they're wearing a, Ger a German uniform or a Japanese uniform. Um, here they're not. Uh, I think, and the second thing is the indefiniteness of detention. Uh, this is something we mentioned that, that uh, all of us have put our finger on before, uh, but I think we shouldn't kid ourselves about Mali, um, even, uh, just turning specifically to Mali. I, I don't think that detention is going to be as limited uh, as Ben thinks. And the reason why is the transnational nature of the conflict. I think the French are going to be out of there very uh, as quickly as they can. Uh, but once the French leave, that doesn't mean that the situation is ended. We know that um, you know, the various Islamist groups in northern Mali have dispersed to the desert. Uh, we know that they have bases of support in places like Algeria, uh, in Libya, uh, and elsewhere within the region. This is going to become a regional problem, and it's going to become an ongoing regional threat. Uh, to that extent, if it's not the French doing detention, uh, someone is going to be detaining uh, militants uh, in this area. Uh, and a lot of times it's not going to be criminal detention. It's going to be de preventive detention because they're concerned about people returning to the battlefield. Uh, this is why, uh, so there's a range of options. I mean, on the one hand, uh, everybody on this panel uh, agrees that preventive detention is something that is done in the case of armed conflict. Uh, the question that's raised is how much process do you give? Uh, on the one hand, uh, you know, Ben's argument um, is that uh, they're not in entitled to counsel. Uh, and I think that there's there's something to that. And I'll let him speak for himself, obviously. Uh, but you know, there's something to that argument, specifically if you map it against traditional um, law of war. Uh, then on the other hand, Raha has much more of a maximalist view, detention with appropriate safeguards, counsel, judicial review, um, appropriate procedures to engage in. Um, what I want to, 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 you know, Raha went through a lot of the uh, applicable law. Uh, but one diagram that's meant a lot to me um, is actually uh, uh, put together by the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Detainee Operations, Bill Litzow. Um, I've uh, published it in a, um, in a book chapter that I've written. Um, it's, it's very good. I mean, what it, in, what, it, what it shows is traditional law of war, you know, uh, both law of war and also uh, what we could uh, deem for uh, colloquial purposes law of peace, where you uh, have you know, the criminal justice system. Uh, Prevent detention in places like Gitmo doesn't really fit comfortably into any of these situations. Uh, we can draw principles from the Geneva Conventions, but this doesn't quite map with any situation that we've uh, faced and settled. Uh, so what we're talking about is what principles should be applicable. Uh, the reason I fall a little bit more towards Raha's side in this is because I think that, that this is actually going to be a problem that is with us for decades to come, and perhaps for all of the, the 21st century. Uh, not the problem specifically of Al-Qaeda, but the problem of bad, violent, non-state actors that become problems in multiple countries and can threaten multiple countries. Uh, I think that we are going to see the problem of state failure escalating absolutely over the course of the next decade to two decades. And we're going to have the question, how do we deal with these guys? I think because you potentially have multiple conflicts that will last for more than 10 years, 20 years, 25 years, uh, it's better to have more safeguards in place at the outset. Uh, to me, and, and you know, Ben's work uh, on Gitmo is, is fantastic, I think. Um, and one thing that uh, his work and, and the work of other scholars outlines very well is how one of the problems that we have had with the Guantanamo Bay detention facilities is how, you know, initially, it was basically a legal black hole. We didn't know how to deal with these guys, and we put the kind of safeguards on the minimalist end of things. I think we should draw a lesson from that, and in the future we should pr try to provide more safeguards. But I don't want this to become a schadenfreude thing, where people point their fingers at the US or at France. That's why I think it's important for multiple countries to get involved in the question of what kind of procedure do we apply? Because I don't want to see the next detention operation, whether it's French or American or even Malian, to become the kind of toxic issue uh, that Gitmo has been, where I think that a lot of the uh, toxicity um, far outstrips what is currently warranted circa 2013.
So I, I, I think it's worth actually disaggregating several different types of detention because I think yeah. the the um, the the nature of the the apparent disagreement here is. Uh, the disagreement may be a little bit more apparent than, than real, um, once, at least with respect to certain types of detention. Um, I, so take at one extreme, um, long-term detention under the laws of war uh, of the type that we have done both at Guantanamo and at Bagram. Um, we don't really talk about the detentions at Bagram very much, the long-term detentions. Um, but there have been some. They've gone on. Some of the detainees there are really indistinguishable from the detainees at Guantanamo, except that they weren't brought to Guantanamo because at some point we stopped bringing people <coughs> to Guantanamo. Um, I have long advocated very robust processes, including judicial processes, for this to manage and this type of detention. Um, and in fact, one of my problems with U.S. detention policy and with the closed Guantanamo movement is that it's focused on closing the one detention facility that actually gives these processes. Um, and I would much rather see, for example, the 50 or so detainees being held at Bagram who do not have access to habeas review, who do not have counsel, who do not have um, their cases uh, fly specked by federal judges and reviewed by the DC Circuit and ultimately the Supreme Court. I would rather see them brought to Guantanamo where David can go represent them and meet with them. Um, sorry to pick on you, David. Um, <laughs> you know, and advocate their cases in federal court. Um, I would rather see that. Now, you know, some, there are a lot of people who are uh, very down on the way judicial review in federal court has turned out. That's a complicated s discussion, in some ways a separate discussion. Um, but I am not making an argument as a general proposition against very robust counsel access and um, judicial review of long-term law of war detentions. In fact, I would like to see mechanisms by which that could be augmented in some ways. I think the area in which we are disagreeing um, is what do you do in terms of field combat um, detention operations in what you envision to be relatively short term? Um, what's the degree of process or, ju or judicial or otherwise that you are going to use as screening mechanisms when you're dealing with relatively large numbers of detainees, hundreds, thousands, that you're capturing in very short periods of time in field situations. Um, I actually, this is the point on which I think Raha and I disagree, and I'm actually a little bit surprised that David is, is closer to Raha than he is to me on this. Um, I, I think this is an area where there is no plausible involvement um, for counsel or the judiciary. This is a, it's a question of field management of detention operations. There are good screening criteria, there are bad screening criteria, there are criteria that get you in trouble, um, and there's a need for fine-grained good processes, but they do tend to be, they will tend to be, they are internal military processes, um, and that's actually what um, you know, if you, if you look at the, the civilian internment provisions of, of, the Geneva, of Geneva 4, or if you look at the, uh, you know, Article 5 tribunal requirements of Geneva 3, and these are, so this is sort of hybrid stuff, so you kind of look a little bit to both. That's kind of what they're talking about, and, and, I, and I am very traditional in that regard. David is certainly correct that, you know, you do the, these types of operations, and we saw this in Iraq, we're seeing it now in Afghanistan, and the French will experience it in Mali, whereas you capture people, you hold them for a while, and then as you exit, you have to figure out how to transition that to the local government. Um, and though that problem 
um, which you can deride, as I did earlier in this conversation, as proxy force detention. And I do have a certain contempt for it when done as a way of avoiding detention responsibilities ourselves. And sometimes it is done that way. Um, it's also an inevitable feature of disengaging from a conflict that you get into. And so I think the, you know, David is certainly right that as you think about um, what the longer term looks like, you have to think about it as, a, as primarily a Malian project. David, we've got a microphone coming to you right away. Thank you. Uh, these, these aren't so much questions as, as trying to identify issues that I think have not been touched on that should be or touched on too lightly. One is the paradigm within which we're discussing this whole issue. It reminds me a lot of the justifications for US troops in Vietnam in the 60s and other countries that we rationalized going into on the ground that we were containing a global threat, namely the threat of communism. I think that we need to examine the uh, predicate of this entire discussion about preventive detention, which is that, once again, we're trying to act as the world's policeman. And that certainly didn't work out in Vietnam, and it's not going to work out here. Then the second point that I'd make with, that flows out of this paradigm is the effects of what we're doing. Look at the effects on the US economy. As somebody said, Cheney and Bush basically went on a, a credit card spree uh, to finance the Iraq war and the rest of the uh, war on terrorism, uh, which probably ballooned our debt uh, more, than, more than anybody had ballooned our debt, consisting of maybe four or five presidents before Bush. We need to look at the effect on our international uh, moral standing and reputation of trying to be the world's policeman. And a lot of this, as uh, Davi pointed out, is that we are actually bolstering foreign dictators and autocrats because they then claim to be fighting terrorism when they're really operating for internal political purposes, such as crushing movements, and take Yemen, for example. The Houthi in the north, uh, the southern separatist movement in the south, Sala built his uh, military opposition to these political movements as a movement as, as a fight against Al-Qaeda. Anybody who opposed the regime was listed as Al-Qaeda. Um, then we get to the point about whether or not what we're doing is actually efficacious. As far as I can see, we're squeezing a balloon. This is a point made by Gregory Johnson. We go to war in Afghanistan and Pakistan. We're fairly effective. The next refuge is Yemen. The next Al Qaeda uh, areas of activity are Somalia, Mali, other places. And if we fight them and win over there, then we face a problem somewhere else. So in that sense, it's never ending. As long as we are trying to operate as world police, we're essentially simply shifting the problem from one place to another. Uh, then we're quickly talking about Gitmo. I just want to make my, uh, my standard point that when we talk about closing Guantanamo, we're not talking about, we're not talking about closing it as a facility, which most people understand uh, the idea of closing Guantanamo. Hey, we're talking about closing the idea of Guantanamo, and I think that's a point that I've discussed endlessly with Ben, because the whole idea of preventive detention and detention without justice is one that Guantanamo exemplifies. Our idea, and when I say our, I think I am stating a broader view among human rights groups or civil liberties groups, although I'm only speaking for myself here, uh, is that uh, the idea here would be transfers rather than closing the facility. Now, with respect to returning to the battlefield, which is an aspect of transfers, uh, 88 
of 166 detainees at Guantanamo have been unanimously cleared for transfer by the uh, 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 agencies within the United States that are stakeholders, the uh, Department of Defense, the CIA, the Director of National Intelligence, the Homeland Security uh, uh, Administration, uh, the State Department. These are people who our own government has determined are not a threat to the United States. Uh, talking about uh, you'd rather be in Guantanamo in a nice uh, air-conditioned cell than be tortured in Yemen, I have to say that the clients I've spoken to have said they'd rather be tortured in their own country than stuck in Guantanamo because at least they can see their families, at least it's a common culture, and at least it's a common language. It may seem counterintuitive, but you know, I'd rather be, I mean, I don't know whether I'd share that view uh, because I have the uh, luxury of being in a country that, 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 no long, that doesn't torture Americans as far as I can see. Um, so I guess uh, going back, I guess in addition on the international effects point, I won't, I mean, I'm repeating myself, so then I'll sit down. You have, you have the governments uh, claiming general Al-Qaeda justifications for crushing political movements or uh, uh, providing a precedent of the U.S. I remember one of the briefs we filed years ago in the Hampton case at an early stage. We had about a dozen foreign dictators who invoked the same principles as the United States as justification for sweeping up people into indefinite detention. So I'm identifying all those points, and I'd be very grateful if some of the members of the panel would uh, respond to that. All right. Why don't I handle this first? Uh, I'll, I'll go down point by point. Uh, the first thing, the first point that you make, David, is that the U.S. is acting uh, as the world's policeman. Uh, I think, in general, I should say the communism thing is the president. That. Sure, sure. Um, There's a communism thing. Proliferating. I, I understand. I understand. And uh, there's, t there's two things I'll say there. The first is, I think it's true uh, that we've been essentially acting as the world's policeman. I think that, that this is a mistake um, in that I think that Al-Qaeda and other problems are international problems. They're not just the U.S.'s problem. Uh, it's been very costly for the United States. But just like uh, the fact that the threat of communism caused the U.S. to uh, function as the world's policeman doesn't mean that communism wasn't a problem. So, too, does the past decade not indicate that al-Qaeda isn't a problem. Uh, al-Qaeda is a problem. Uh, and when you look at both people who've been killed by al-Qaeda and other Islamist groups uh, and what it looks like to live under their rule, um, regardless of what one could say about Gitmo, uh, I would also much rather be in Gitmo than to live in Somalia under Shabab's rule, for example, um, or to live in Yemen uh, in areas that ACAP came to control. Uh, one can, it's not too difficult to look online, uh, find videos, jihadist videos from Mali of uh, people getting their hands chopped off, people getting beheaded uh, by the legal system that was set up. I mean, this ultimately is a problem, and it's a problem that's not going away. And regardless of our bad strategic decisions, uh, it is real. Um, this brings you to the second point, which is the effect on the U.S. economy. I'll point you to just one single thing there, which is we have an entire book that actually addresses that point. And I'm largely in agree agreement with you. It's called Bin Laden's Legacy. It, all of you could pick it up at the, at the table outside. And it's, it's for free, so I'm not trying to sell my book. But if um, you want to pay, you may. But yeah. <laughs> Uh, by all means, I, I will, I will uh, if you want a signature, $10 a piece. Um, but, uh, I mean, th that's the entire point that I made in the book, that this has been an incredibly costly war. Uh, we've undertook it in, I think, a disastrous uh, strategic matter. But th these first two points that you raised are simply unrelated to the question of detention, right? Like, regardless of us acting as the, US's, as the world's policemen or how our economy has been hurt, 
we still need a detention policy if this is a problem for which people are going to need, need to be detained. Well, that's uh, what I was questioning. So then, well, I'll get to that, because I'm, I'm going, I'm handling your points in order, <laughs> sir. Um, and you made about eight different points. So <laughs> forgive me that I haven't yet addressed your eighth point. Um, you say that uh, we're bol bolstering international autocrats. Again, not related to detention, but this is something we need to do a better job. We've certainly gotten played by Yemen. In the case of drone strikes, you know, we've even gotten played by them to carrying out strikes against enemies of the regime. That's a problem when you're dealing with unfamiliar environments. The fact is local actors, whether they're autocrats or something less than autocrats, are going to try to play you. The US, due to its lack of cultural familiarity and I think our naivety and other reasons, perhaps even our fears, has gotten played. We need to do a better job of that, but not related to detention. Now, is it effective? We're squeezing a balloon. In many ways, yes, we're squeezing a balloon. Uh, but the flip side of that is you also can't allow uh, the, I mean, to, to completely take your metaphor and put it in a different context. You, know, you can't allow the balloon to keep on inflating in certain areas. At the end of the day, we went into Afghanistan. If the alternative is to simply let the Taliban maintain its safe haven for al-Qaeda, that's not a particularly acceptable alternative. Uh, for one thing I like about Mali is that the US isn't the one going into Mali. Other countries recognized it as a problem. Uh, the French did. Uh, they thought that uh, the, the situation in Mali would, play, would, would pose a danger in Europe and in France. And I think they're correct, that it would pose a danger to them before it would to us. Um, but their calculus was that this was an unacceptable situation. And it certainly did pose a safe haven uh, to actors there. Uh, actors that included al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. I think that, that strategically we need to do a better job of understanding how do you deal with this particular situation. And I have my thoughts on how to deal with it strategically. Um, but if the alternative is simply let them grow, um, there will be a lot of lives lost as a result. There are lives lost in warfare, um, but there are also lives lost when you uh, allow a safe haven to grow and people to uh, plan to carry out attacks. Uh, you say you want to close the idea of Gitmo. Um, transfers, not closure, um, and that people are cleared for transfer. Let's first deal with the, the fact that people are cleared for transfer. That, that's both impressive and in other ways unimpressive. And when you look at the people who've been cleared for transfer, they include, for example, Abdullah Saleh al-Ajmi, who carried out a suicide attack in Mosul that killed 13 Iraqi soldiers in 2008, Saeed al-Shikri, uh, who was implicated in the bombing of the U.S. Embassy in Sana'a back in September 2008. 19 were killed, 16 were injured. Um, also, uh, Sufyan Ben Kumo in Libya, someone who's been active in the militant factions there. Um, you look at uh, you know, others, uh, Arabesh, the leading theologian for ACAP. Uh, he's also an individual uh, who was cleared for release. We don't always get those decisions right. Now, that's not to say that one shouldn't give weight to people being cleared for release. Obviously, you should, because that means that, that the judicial process, uh, such as it is, has made a certain decision. Um, but people who've been cleared for release certainly have had blood on their hands. Um, in terms of closing the idea of Gitmo, uh, I don't think that one can eliminate the idea of preventive detention. I mean, we're in situations that look much more like warfare than criminal justice. Um, not, not all over the place. Uh, I mean, I think one thing that uh, I agree on with Raha, and I think Ben agrees on this as well, is that in situations where someone has committed a crime, best to try them through a criminal justice system. But um, as, as Ben put his finger on, um, when you have you know, a large number of people snapped up uh, in a place like Mali or in a place like Somalia, people are going to be detained. There will be preventive detention. If we want to wash our hands and get out of the business of that, uh, you know, the result is that people will either be detained locally, or as has happened in certain places in Mali, you've had Arabs and Tuaregs who've just been summarily executed and put in a well. Uh, I know, I, I fully understand what your clients are saying, that they'd rather be tortured in their home country, but I wonder what people who are in a Somali prison would say, uh, whether they prefer the situation in a Somali prison to being held elsewhere. Ultimately, one can't make... Well, they don't have that option either. I, I don't think that the Somali prison has the, would you like to sign up for Guantanamo <laughs> option? And you know, perhaps if they did, uh, you know, you'd find people signing up for that. But you know, I don't think Gitmo is there to let you know, other actors 
you know, deal with their problems that way. I think that, that the less money the U.S. spends, the better off we are, I believe, in spreading the burden. But the idea of preventive detention, to me, it's simply going to be there because this is not just a criminal justice problem because of the problem of state collapse. I, I want to bring Dawid on this because he knows a lot more than I do about it, but I think it's an, uh, an important point here that when we talk about the U.S.'s role of policemen, we are talking about Mali here as, as well. That was Churlish or not, that's part of the agenda. And in Mali, the U.S. has not acted as the policeman, but the French did decide to to, to intervene. And far from Schadenfreude, I, I, I give them, I, I commend the French for what they've done, and I commend the French for what they've done, not least because they are trying to uh, save. Uh, the culture uh, of Mali. When the jihadists came into Timbuktu, uh, among the first things they did, and I think this is important, and it was, I don't think it got nearly enough attention, was to destroy the ancient shrines and mosques um, that the, that are, are central to the culture of African Islam, which has developed over many, many centuries. And their goal was to entirely bulldoze it and destroy it once and for all, forever. Saving that culture, it seems to me, is the main um, objective of what the French are doing, as well as not allowing the jihadists to have a large area in order to set up uh, their, their own training camps and, and plan plot terrorism. I commend them for that. I would hate to see Timbuktu destroyed, and a lot of it has been destroyed, and I would hate to see African Islam destroyed. And I don't see how anyone can say that they are, so that they believe in defending Islam, but they're just perfectly, it's perfectly acceptable for the jihadists to destroy more than 700 years of Islamic history in, in, in Timbuktu. And, and Dawid, again, you know more about this than I do. Would you agree with me, and would you... Uh, can I just answer one thing with one sentence that one Dawid has said? The reason that some of the things that I said don't seem to have much to do with preventive detention per se, I think my basic point here is that if you answered a lot of the questions that I've raised, preventive detention wouldn't be a very big issue for the United States. That's that's why I see a relationship. Here. I'll quickly answer that sentence with probably two to three sentences. Uh, which is, uh, as I said, it's still a problem. And if it's not the U.S. dealing with it, somebody else is going to have to deal with this issue. Uh, again, that's why um, I think that uh, looping the French into this discussion is important because I think we're going to need a set of principles to deal with this. At the end of the day, um, as states collapse and as uh, violent non-state actors are able to pose a problem regionally, not just within that state, suddenly it becomes uh, many people's problem, if not the United States, uh, someone else's. So this is an issue that simply is not going to disappear, even if the U.S. is less involved in dealing with the problem of jihadism, state collapse, and violent non-state actors. Dewey, did you want to add anything to what I had to say? Thank you. I hope we are not suggesting that uh, we bring Malian detentions here in America. So uh, if that suggestion is not there, then the, uh, the Guantanamo, yeah, as a precedence, as an idea, as a, as a very sensitive point in American history, it can be discussed. But it's not directly relevant to what is happening now in Mali. Yeah? So uh, the French are more relevant in, 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 the, in, the, in the Mali situation. So uh, the French really did, according to me, did a wonderful job co coming in. Uh, and hitting hard on the jihadists and trying at least saving the this uh, heritage that is thousands of years old heritage. I think they saved the situation, they saved those, uh, the culture, and they saved people also, and they saved the, the country from a uh, utter civil war. But to suggest again that the French should stay there and establish a judicial system or a system and oversee the, the detention, I don't think that's uh, right. Um, I think the best thing that can happen now is the French provide support for the establishment of the institutions that can handle preventive detention. Eh? Um, uh, the French have been there before. Uh, this, uh, with the thing that Mali's problem now was not caused by jihadists. It was probably the trigger was the problem was triggered by a government that was not able to handle the situation in 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 in, in, uh, in, uh, in Mali. That was a trigger, a very ineffective, corrupted system, and the systems, the institutions are not there now. And 
Yeah, and the French, by coming there, I don't think they can solve the problem also. What can, and they have been there before, they have been there for 80 years, 100 years, so they have not been able to establish a system. So they cannot stay there now for a few months and establish a system, but what they can do is help over a long period of time, the Malian government to have a democratic system first, because that's the framework. The bigger framework is a democratic system, a, 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 a free country uh, that can, where people can exercise their, their individual liberties. So to be able to establish that kind of government, and within that government, then preventive detention um, can <coughs> take place, and we can be assured of a. Uh, of a reasonable handling of, of the, of the de detainees. But in the meantime, what can be done? In the meantime, now, because there are captured people, what can be done? I think that's a question that needs to be discussed between the French and, and the Mali. What can be done? That's, that's an issue. To, uh, well, talking about the precedent, we did a fabulous job in Iraq yes. with uh, building up their democratic institutions and building up a judicial system with fairness and democracy. It's, it's, it's now. Let me, uh, let me go to Angela for, for a question. Hello, I'm Angela Dickey. I'm a U.S. Foreign Service officer, currently assigned to the U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, so I'm bringing a perspective of a lot of field work and also my, in my new role at the Institute of Peace. So what I've heard today, there's a hole in the laws of war with regard to this kind of gray area of preventive detention. Seems to me uh, that we need to correct that. Um, even though philosophically I agree with David, maybe because I've lived in Yemen, Mauritania, right next to Mali, spent a lot of time with Tuaregs, and also um, Vietnam, I spent four years there, so I agree philosophically <laughs> with him, but I agree with David that th the fact is that we're in these situations now, and these situations are going to continue for some time, and uh, USIP, you probably don't know this, but uh, the USIP is uh, one of the organizations that trains African peacekeepers. And the, the reason I mention this is because uh, these kind of gray area situations um, are, be are, are going to be faced by people that we are training. You've probably read in the papers, U.S. Army or Beltway Bandits are training lots of African armies. A couple of weeks ago, I was in Burundi to observe, because I'm going to start participating in training Burundian peacekeepers. And one of the things we're supposed to train them in is how to protect civilians. Yeah. And, and to protect civilians sometimes, you're going to have to train, you're going to have to detain a bad guy, okay? These guys that, I'm, that I observed being trained and that I will be training, they are going to Somalia next month. Now, some of the guys that we're training haven't anything higher than a high school or grammar school education. They, this is the first exposure to protection of civilians. They haven't heard a lot of these concepts before. Okay, so now we're in a situation where we have the proxy because we're the U.S. is not going to have boots on the ground in all these African countries, but we're training ten African militaries on going into these situations: Somalia, maybe Mali. So we're going to have some kind of derivative responsibility because we're training them, are we not? So when the guy says to me, what, what, are, what, are, what are my guidelines for, for what do I do if I'm faced with somebody doing something bad against a civilian? You know, what do I tell him in my training? I don't know what the Beltway Bandits are training him in their military training. And we have a narrow curriculum at USIP that we train them on protection of civilians. But I, I'm telling you, this is a, you know, a very practical problem that is going on right now on the ground. And uh, we've got to figure it out. So it seems to me, uh, you know, one, once upon a time, a long time ago, we figured out the Geneva Conventions. Now we know there's a hole in the Geneva Conventions with respect to this problem. It seems to me we should rely on our diplomats and figure out a way to, to close this hole because the problem is going to continue and since we're already out there I agree with you maybe we shouldn't be in some places but since we are out there we've got to fix the hole somehow can I yep. briefly respond to that sure. um, I just want to and you know I, I agree with you know thank you that's a really really important contribution um, I just wanted to make uh, everyone aware of a couple of initiatives that are ongoing to deal with the question of detention procedures, gu guidelines, and authorities in non-international armed conflict. One is sponsored by the International Committee of the Red Cross, 
um, which is identified that you talk about. Um, uh, we are of the view that human rights norms can provide sufficient guidelines and basis to deal with this issue. Not everyone agrees with that position. I imagine Ben and David do not agree with that position. Um, uh, but so that's one of the initiatives out there that is looking at this question of detention and non-international armed conflict and the procedures and guidelines and strengthening protections for civilians in particular. Um, the other is sponsored by uh, the Danish Foreign Ministry and Thomas Winkler over there um, trying to bring together governments and uh, militaries and non-governmental uh, organizations um, in a very similar um, initiative to try to develop baseline uh, principles and, agree and agreed upon procedures for detention in non-international armed conflict or even more broadly. So I just wanted people to be, if you're curious about this issue, you should follow those two initiatives because they're ongoing and they're developing uh, quite quickly. And, and it... Um, yeah. No, Go, good, I've spoken enough. One, one, one second. I appreciate, I, I've been to Africa, uh, to many places in Africa. I've been to Yemen, I've been to many places. The problem in most of these countries is there is a lot of training, there's a lot of American money coming into training, training, but we don't focus in establishing democratic institutions, functional democratic institutions. That's where we fail. Wherever we go, we have trained people, we have invested money, but in the end, they have got government collapse because we don't have that functional uh, democratic system. So the effort should be in established. In, in, in Mali, America was there for, for many years. France was there for many years. How did it happen that this government became so ineffective, the military became so corrupt that they cannot even um, secure their own borders? Because perhaps it is that we didn't look at the bigger fr framework, the bigger picture. Is this government functioning properly? Is the democratic system with the, are the values there? So it's very important the culture, the values, the institutions, they should be there. And I think the focus should be on that. Otherwise, it's a domino effect. We'll see now many African countries falling apart, like, like uh, what's happening in Afghanistan and all other places. So I think the focus should be on training, yes, good, but also the bigger picture of establishing institutions, democratic institutions, functioning democratic institutions. Yeah. And um, I, I want to say that I think that the initiatives that, that Raha highlights, but particularly the ICRC initiative, are, are, are quite important. Uh, for one reason, going to David's point about international moral standing, uh, I think that having uh, a set of norms to deal with this problem uh, is extremely important uh, to showing that, that these problems are dealt with uh, following the rule of law. Uh, and that's one reason that that I think that um, you know, focusing on the French uh, is important here, because it's not just a U.S. problem. It's a problem other countries uh, have to deal with as well. Uh, one thing that, that's kind of frustrating for me within this debate, um, and uh, I'm not talking about David here, but sometimes you'll see uh, you know people who uh, are about as alarmist as possible about Gitmo. You know, it's the worst thing ever. Um, and then you know at the end of kind of a long. Uh, tirade, off, usually uh, accompanied by photos of Camp X-Ray, which has been closed since uh, early 2002. Um, there's this uh, um, something tacked on at the end about how it hurts our international moral standing. Well, okay, but you know, uh, when someone has just done all they can to uh, try to argue the U.S. has no international moral standing, to then argue that they care about it uh, is extremely problematic. And again, I'm not talking about David here, uh, but this is one part of the debate which I think is so problematic and so destructive to us. Um, I think that we all uh, have a stake, um, both in ensuring that innocent people aren't railroaded into captivity for long periods, something which has happened. Uh, well, at the same time, we all have a stake in ensuring that people who wish harm to the United States or to its allies or to innocent civilians um, that they can be detained while conflicts are ongoing. Um, I mean, I think that this has been a very productive discussion, and I think it's the kind of discussion that we actually uh, need on this issue, as opposed to the uh, just, frankly, atrocious public discourse which has dominated for much of the past decade. Is there, I, I want to broaden in a way what Angela asked about, I, because it strikes me that it may be more than a whole that what we may be trying to do here is impose uh, a template that, uh, or a number, a series of templates that really do not fit and cannot fit. Is there any, what I'm asking, is there any sympathy for the position that you can't apply criminal justice to this problem of, uh, of non-state uh, terrorism? You can't apply really World War II and potent and 
basically post-World War II rules of law, that you can't simply say, you know, let's go back to Vietnam and look at and, and impose that template. That what you really need to do is set up a new legal framework for a new kind of, uh, of warfare with new technology. This would entail a national security court. It would entail whole new rules on, the, on such things as detention. And it would, you would establish, in other words, rules of law for a war that was not envisioned by Geneva, was not envisioned before, war, before World War II, and was not envisioned certainly by a criminal justice system. And, just, and, and you would not, in a sense, be putting judges in charge of war fighting, except to the extent that you would establish whole new systems, procedures, and institutions to do this. And this is hard work, but it really needs to be done. It's not being done on the national level, and it's not being done It's on the international level. Everything has been ad hoc up to, up to now. Um, so I was actually one of the original, uh, not, not the original proponent of the idea of the National Security Corps, but one, one of the uh, sort of early proponents of the idea. Um, and I've abandoned it. Um, I, not, I, I've abandoned it because m most of what is valuable about the idea has been already incorporated into law. And what is, um, remains is, I think, not actually especially valuable. So the, 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 to me, the, the, the thing that was important in the idea of a national security court was, A, a specialized uh, forum in which to do judicial review of long-term detentions. We actually have that now in, in the US District Court for the District of Columbia. The second was a, a specialized forum for the trial of terrorist suspects who were accused of war crimes. Um, the military commissions, uh, to varying degrees of success and with a lot of hiccups, is sort of serving that function, whether that function is such a great idea or not is actually a complicated question. Um, but I, I think the, the project is hard enough if you envision it as adapting domestic and international law to fill the gap that, that Angela's question asks about. I, and I'm all for institutional reforms that alleviate that. I do think there's a very big risk of saying, OK, let's try to recreate the wheel here. Um, we have a lot of wheels here, and they have good applications for certain functions. Um, the criminal law gets you a certain way in a certain amount of areas. Military law gets you a certain amount of way in a certain, amount of area, certain number of areas. Other functions, um, covert action law gets you certain distance in certain areas. Um, and I think the, the temptation to say, let's tear it all up and start over again. The, the military commissions actually provide a cautionary tale against doing that. Uh, you know, Raha and I have a little dog and pony show. We, can, we go on, on the road debating the military commissions. Uh, but I think on that point, we actually agree that you know, if you were sort of doing it from scratch and you're saying, you know, why do you want to create a new institution to try these cases, the answer is probably that you don't. And the chief function that, you know, and that, I say that as somebody who will defend the commissions and, and you know, believe they have a role to play, I, I'm not sure if you ask as an original matter, do you want to create a whole new tribunal that doesn't exist before, um, that, you know, 12 years of experience, 11 years of experience now is, has not made that seem like the greatest idea in the world. And that does uh, caution me a little bit uh, against the sort of more ebullient efforts to kind of recreate a kind of, you know, the, the laws of war, broadly speaking. And I think the, the path of gradual evolution, um, you know, through state practice through treaty development through is 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 a is a positive one 